<clears throat> let's um, skip to 43 and we begin immediately so that we cover as much ground as possible in the little time that we have. Ah, okay, great. So um, before we start, I would like to remind us of a few words that can get us in sticky situations, um, especially when you're asked to describe the gross morphology or to describe what you can see. So just a quick reminder, when you see something whitish um, and it looks like um, a streak or probably that could be fibrosis. If you see something black, that is, could be necrosis. When you see something red, that is probably hemorrhage. Now for size of the organs, you can say an organ is large, um, small. Now all other definitions or other, uh, other definitions include things like papules, nodules, macules, you know, as an organ can be solid or a gross morphology can be solid, it can be well circumscribed, yeah, it can extend to adjacent tissue, it can be alteration, it can be cavitation, it can be cystic, and it can also be purulent, right? So those are kind of some of the kind of words that can help you to get out of sticky situations when they tell you to describe the gross morphology of, of some organs. Or, or gross morphology of pathologies that are being displayed. So maybe before you go to the exam, maybe keep that in mind and it might help. Okay, and we'll also try to use them as much as possible when we are describing all the pathologies that we see um, because they, they'll come in handy and, and through repetition, they'll become second nature. Okay, from this diagram that is shown, um, maybe we can describe the gross morphological features that can be seen and uh, put our responses in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, according to this word, it's got, uh, it's got things that look like nodules. Yeah, it has a uh, nodular-like appearances. And maybe we can describe the size of these nodules. Are they large or are they small? These nodules appear. Yeah, they also appear large and raised. I agree. Also, maybe someone can say small. So I guess uh, maybe size is relative. Me, they look millet like. Um, maybe millet like. I might disagree, but um, yeah, maybe I'm not hundred percent sure on millet like. Um, but if we say that they look nodular, right, and uh. Size that give or take they are large, small, right? Um, do they extend to the adjacent tissue? Uh, are they well, um, are they solid? Yeah, maybe those are some of the questions you can ask. So, what will be the diagnosis of this pathology? Um, you can see down there, miliary, or tuberculous, very tight. So, this is when you have a TB infection. That is outside the normal place that you expect to find it. That is the lung or the chest cavity. So when TB spreads like this, we call it extra pulmonary tuberculosis. And this example here, tuberculous peritonitis, is a good example of perit um, tuberculous peritonitis. Um, so for example, uh, extra pulmonary TB, sorry. Now, what are some of the features that you'll expect or some of the clinical signs that you'll expect a patient with? Tuberculous peritonitis to have. Mm -hmm. Let's put our, our responses in the chat. How will a patient with tuberculous um, peritonitis present? What are some of the clinical features of this pathology? Um, uh, yes, Viva. Yeah. So, First, you also have yeah, the classical presentation of TB. Yeah, that's fevers. Mm -hmm. Which other ones? Maybe we can mention the classical ones. Then we go to maybe the ones that are particular to the intestinal GIT. Yeah, weight loss, weight loss. So we have fever, weight loss. Which are the classical ones? Malaise, yes. Night sweats, I agree. And now we can go to the ones for the ileum or the GIT. Abnormal pain, exactly, yeah. 
presented abdominal pain. Mostly, right? Um, others are new tech, you can still find them. Now, this ascites, ascites. Mm -hmm. Any others? Okay, maybe we can continue with the next one. So describe the pathology, I think we did. We said um, multiple nodules, and here we've said presence of multiple tubercles. So those, two, those nodules, maybe we can call them tubercles. Now give three varieties of the above pathology. We have acetic form, purulent form, and cystic form, and cystic form, and fibrinous form. Okay, identify the most common distribution of the above or where they most commonly occur. So we have them occurring mostly at the ilium, especially specifically um, the ileocecal junction, you'll find them there a lot. Okay, great. Any questions on that? Maybe you can go and look a little bit more on the features that are extra pulmonary or outside the classical um, appearance of TB. Abdominal pains, I think someone mentioned ascites. Maybe you can go clarify on those ones as well. Great, we move to the next one. Uh, what do we think this pathology could be? And maybe while you are teaching someone, or a couple of us can put the gross morphological features that we can see. Uh, someone says gastroschisis. A uh, lot of responses saying gastroschisis. Now, for us, we're going with gastroschisis. Why did we go with gastroschisis? So usually gastroschisis um, is, an, is due to a defect in the abdominal wall right, in the lateral abdominal wall. So if we look at this image, um, is this pathology on the abdominal wall or is it lower towards the pelvis and the rhinium? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can put our responses. Yeah, this, this one looks a bit lower, right? And you know gastroschisis, um, is a pathology, as I said before, of the lateral abdominal wall, where you have the umbilicus not being involved, right? And also you where you don't have a membrane, but you have herniating intestinal content. So this defect is a bit lower, lower than the abdominal wall. Now, what is lower than the abdominal wall? Which organs do we expect to find around here? Yeah, so we expect to find things like the bladder. We expect to find things like, for example, the uterus. So for lateral is gastroschisis. For anterior is a, um, um, uh, what do you call this, omphalocele. Now, maybe we can go back um, to what we are talking about. So someone said, uh, someone said the genitalia, exactly. So genitalia. So this has to be a pathology of either, either pathology of something to do with the genitalia, either the bladder, either the, 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 the cloaca, right? Either the anus, either the vagina or the penis, if it was a, if it was a, male, fit, a male child, sorry. Now, this pathology, we have to agree, it's not on the anterior abdominal wall. I, I guess that's a place, that's the place where we should start. Now, of those pathologies which I've, which I've mentioned, um, what do we think it, it could be? Will it be bladder? And also when you look at this child, there's something missing. There's an opening or there's an office missing. Which office is missing? Yes, is the anal, sorry, the anal office is missing. This pathology here is what you call cloacal extrophy. Remember in early embryogenic period, um, we have the cloacal or the cloaca, um, which will form, I think, um, the office of the anus. And so here we don't have the cloaca. So this is cloacal extrophy. We also have, if it was um, up here, a bit to the upper part, you would have um, bladder extrophy. So maybe we can go um, polish up on that. This is cloacal extrophy. Any questions on that? Yeah, 
Let's move to the next one. Ah, okay. Maybe let's describe the gross morphological features of this pathology here. I agree, yes. Mm -hmm. Any other thing? Maybe the color, size, hemorrhagic areas evidenced by the reddish color, right? I agree. Anything else? So, um, what is uh, the correct identification of this pathology? Yeah, so this is called apoidil chasia. This is a sort of a congenital anomaly where you have the proximal gia genome ending blindly and uh, also the distal small bile wraps around its blood supply in a spiral manner. Yeah, leading to this kind of apoidil appearance. It is what you call apoidil atresia. Right, and I see most of you are spot on with that. Okay, move to the next one. Ah, okay. Maybe let's describe the gross morphology for this. Now, mm -hmm. we see something that is outpouching, right? Sort of extending. Yeah, it looks like a diverticulum, right? Yes, and I think that's the pathology as well. I think the person was mentioning the pathology, which is correct. So which type of diverticulum is this? Yeah, so this is Merkel's diverticulum. So it is a Merkel's diverticulum. So basically, um, here you have um, a lot of poaching, protruding from the alimentary canal, right? So maybe in the, if you ask to describe the gross morphology, you can say there's an poaching. I also see some reddish areas, probably that's significant for hemorrhage, right? And um, so basically, you have two types of diverticulum. Who knows these types of diverticulum? How can you classify diverticulum? Yeah, yes, exactly. You have true or false diverticulum. The Merkel diverticulum, is it a true or is it a false one? It is a true. Why do we say it's a true? Yes, exactly. It has all the layers of the gut wall. Now for the false, it has it only has the um mucosa and submucosa. The Merkel is that true because it has all the layers of the gut wall. Any question on that? Now, um, what are some of the clinical features that can present with this type of diverticular? Mm -hmm. Clinical features. How is a patient typically going to present? Yeah, obstruction. I agree. Near the ilium. Any other features? Bloating. Bloating. I'm not sure about bloating, but yeah, maybe confirm that. There's also hematochesia or melania, but less commonly. There's also right lower quadrant pain. And there's intersusception, volvulus, and also someone has mentioned obstruction. Great. Any questions on that? Ah, so, so maybe we can move to the next pathology. Um, so uh, I'm really not sure if they can bring such images, but let's just do it just in case they bring the pathology and it looks something similar. 
So um, what do we see here in this picture? Yes, it looks like sort of a bad beak, right? And um, there's a constriction. And where that constriction begins, um, there's sort of this bad beak-like appearance. So which pathology is it significant for? Yes, achalasia. So this is a bad beak appearance of achalasia. So this is basically where you have failure of the low esophageal sphincter to relax due to sorry, degeneration of inhibitory neutrons in the myenteric plexus. So when you have the low esophageal sphincter failing to relax, it's sort of in a chronic compressed state, and therefore um, it will lead to this bad big kind of appearance. And also note that this is associated with an increased risk in esophageal cancer. Right? What are some of the causes of this bad big achalasia, bad big appearance of achalasia. What are some of its causes? So, yeah, sorry. Exactly. So we have Chagas disease, yeah? which is caused by trypanosoma cruzae. Yes, exactly. And the other cause is idiopathic. So it's not really known why it happens. Now, what is the most common disease presentation of someone who has this pathology? What is the most, yeah, exactly, this page. Great, guys. Move to the next question. This page, I agree. Any questions on that? Yeah, we can proceed to the next. Now here we have a pathology. Maybe describe, let's describe what we can see in the picture. Maybe where the defect is, what the defect is containing, what the defect look like itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, we can describe the pathology. Yes, we have herniated abdominal conflict. Hi, yes. Mm -hmm. What else can you see? Now, there is something covering this content, and someone tells us a translucent membrane. Yes, abdominal wall, thick membrane, transparent membrane. Exactly. So, this um, defect is also found in the anterior abdominal wall, as someone correctly identified. Now, for this defect, is the umbilicus involved or not? Yes, exactly. So for this kind of pathology, the umbilicus is involved. Now, which pathology is this? Someone can name the pathology that yes or false. Fallus, correct. So and we've mentioned the characteristics, and I'm happy with that. And there's a question there. Maybe we can move to the next. Aha. So here we have a pathology. It's a histological slide, and it's showing something. Now, maybe we can describe what we see. Or just give the diagnosis. Let's just give the diagnosis. What could be the diagnosis for this? Mm -hmm. A lymphoid polyp. What helped us come to this diagnosis? What are some of the features that helped us know that we are in certain we are in certain part of the body and that this is where this polyp is most likely to occur? Any responses? Okay, so um, 
where do lymphoid polyps mostly occur? Which organ um, in the GIT? Someone says colon, colon. I think it says the colon or the small intestine. Maybe someone can check for us where lymphoid polyps usually occur. Uh, I think it should be the small intestines, but um, someone can copy confirm. So yeah, so this is probably a, a colon or a small intestine, and you have these hot poachings, right? And um, sort of lymphoid aggregates forming a sort of polyp. That's what you call a lymphoid polyp. Awesome. Move to the next. Mm -hmm. What could be the diagnosis for this? Mm -hmm. Um, what's the diagnosis? Adenomatous polyp. Mm -hmm. So adenomatous polyp have many types. We have villus, tubular, tubulovillus. Yes, I see. So someone has um, put it more clearly. That's tubulovillus. Also oh, not tubular, but tubular adenoma. Now for tubular adenomas, do they have a higher risk of malignancy or a lower risk risk of malignancy compared to villus? A lower risk, exactly. So they have less potentiality to become malignant compared to villus, which is most ominous. Now, between villus and uh, tubular, which one produces mucin-like secretions? Someone says tubular. Mm -hmm. Any other tries? I will go villas, right? Villas. Okay, the next one. Any questions on that so far? Ah, so, so. Now, maybe let's describe the pathology here. What can we see in that diagram or that image? Bottleneck um, lumen. What does it signify? Someone says a uh, stricture. Someone says it signifies duodenal atresia. Mm -hmm. Any more tries? So this is what you call um the napkin ring sign for the apple core lesion on barium enema x-ray and it usually signifies colorectal carcinomatosis now the reason why we come up with that um is because um usually um when you have some colorectal malignancy especially on the right um side or the upper it usually forms this kind of um, appearance and this up uh, we can tell that this is the colon because um, we can see that there's sort of a flexure at the upper right part. You can see that it's going up, then sort of a little bit coming down and that right. So that is, the, I think that's the flexure below the, the liver. Now, this is tell, a telltale sign of um, colorectal malignancy. It's called the apple core lesion. Now, what are some of the risk factors associated with uh, this lesion? What are some of the risk factors associated with the apple collision? They include adenomatous or serrated poly, inflammatory bowel disease, um, tobacco use, and low fiber diet and obesity. Now, in terms of where they appear commonest from, um, yeah, sorry, in terms of where they appear most common, commonest, they are most common at the sigmoidal area. Then you go to the ascending, and then the descending column, right? Awesome. I don't think they can bring um 
this exactly the image so maybe that is more of a by the way that is a apple core lesion or napkin ring sign now the next image is uh, how you have the progression of carcinomatosis right from where there is a mutation to where it's unchecked and to where it proliferates and that helps us in staging so that's just a depiction to show that next mm -hmm. Let's describe this pathology. What can you see in this image? Mm -hmm. Let's put the responses in the chat. Yeah, we can see things that look like ulcers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another try. Things that look polypoid in nature. Mm -hmm. Necrotic. Now, necrotic. Why will you say necrotic? Um, why, uh, maybe give us a feature. Of why we would call it necrotic? Ulcerated polyps. Yes, I think that uh, probably would qualify. Now, um, maybe I can try guide us. Are they large or are they small? Mm -hmm. These lesions, they look large, right? Now, are they patches? Are they nodules? Are they macules? Are they papules? Maybe nodules. You know, the sort of nodular or polypoid, right? Now, do they look solid? Are they well circumscribed? Do they extend to the adjacent tissue? Do they form ulcers? Is there any cavitation? Do they appear cystic? Is there some purulence inside? Maybe that's, that's some of the guiding questions we can ask ourselves and use those terms to describe. Right? So there's, yes, exactly, there's a yellowish substance. Could be pus, we're not sure, but there's a yellowish substance. Maybe we can use that as well inside one of these um, polypoid or papula or cystic like, not cystic, but cavitary like uh, structures. So, what do we think? Um, this picture was taken from which part of the GIT? We are not sure, but we know it's somewhere in the GIT. Okay, so maybe someone can give us um, a diagnosis. What is the possible diagnosis? This is a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, GIST. So the oncogene responsible for this pathology is what we call the C-kit. That is a cytochrome receptor or CD7, um, CD117. So if someone has a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, what are some of the clinical features that the patient may present with? If I have a tumor in my JT, what are some of the clinical features I may present with? Yes, I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. What else? Will I have abdominal pain? Yes, exactly. Will I have some weight loss? Probably because I'm not feeding well. Yeah. And also early satiety. 
exactly and abdominal pain yeah weight loss at least a probably vomiting right because you can't stomach what you've eaten now what are the two most common localized locations for the gastrointestinal trouble tumors where, where are the two most common areas where you can find them In the GIT. Colon, probably not, not that common. Stomach, mm -hmm. one more. Stomach and the small intestines, exactly. So in the stomach, they happen 60% of the time. You're likely to find them the 60% of the times. And in the small intestines, you're likely to find them that 5% of the times. The other 5% could be any other place in there. Small um throughout the GI tract. Good. Any questions so far? So, so we can move to the next one. Now we can see what they've labeled there as the calf muscle. So the question is, what is the most likely diagnosis? Mm -hmm. What is the most likely diagnosis? Exactly, I see you guys are quick. That is deep vein, deep venous thrombosis, right? Name to the risk, link like to risk factors of deep vein thrombosis. Maybe while that, someone can describe, tell us what is deep vein thrombosis. Any responses? Uh, so the risk factors are streaming in. You have long bed rest, pregnancy, age when you're older, you're more likely to be exposed to this, different thrombosis, estrogen, right? Long distance travel. So this is to do with stasis, right? Oral contraceptives, breath, and um, what else? Oral contraceptives, yeah. So for this, maybe you can look at the Vashos triad. So for the Vashos triad, you usually have three points. You have stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial damage, right? For stasis, you have things like when you're post-op, when you're forced to be in bed for a long time, or when you've gone for long drives and flights. So there's a lot of blood stasis, and this can lead to um, DVT forming. And then you look at hypercoagulability. So hypercoagulability, um, the, some of the causes could be factor V laden, oral contraceptives, pregnancy, and basically defects in the coagulation protein, such as protein C, protein S, you know, and antithrombin. So those are the factors that um, affect Vashos can cause DVT, or you look at the virtual child hypercoagulability. For endothelial damage, um, you have um things like surgery, right? Um, this is your exposure of collagen, which is the um, list. So for DVT, when you look at the risk factors, look at them with the virtual child. Now, what are some of the presenting features of a person who has DVT? Yes, there's edema or swelling around that area. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah, I agree, swelling. Swelling. There's pain. Mm -hmm. There's erythema, redness. Yes, pain. Exactly. So you've mentioned all of them. Swelling, redness, warmth, and pain. Tenderness. So tenderness is pain when you touch. Distended veins in the lower limb. So this can probably be seen as um maybe swelling. Great. Um, I think you guys are doing well. Maybe if there are not any questions, we can move to the next question. Mm -hmm. Let's move to the next. So, a 91-year-old Mzee 
came to the hospital smelling of urine. He was unable to control his urine and his bladder did not empty completely. Direct rectal examination confirmed a large prostate. Name two possible diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Let's put our thoughts in the chat. When a person for an elderly child is really really weary, and you don't know what happens, and you do a little bit of practical examination, and you find a spleen, um, prostate. What will you be thinking? Yes, benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostatic cancer. Right? Yes, exactly. So this will be up there in your priority of concerns. Now, what lab tests will you send them to do immediately after you find that um, large prostate? You will do total PSA, PSA levels. Mm -hmm. Any other test you will do? So you've already done the rectal exam, and that's how you found that they had a enlarged prostate. So which other test would you do? So someone says free PSA. So that's part of the PSA levels. Free total PSA ratio, all of them are called PSA levels. Now, you can also do the prostatic acid phosphatase, that is PAP levels. This who asks? biopsy depending on the PSA levels exactly. So when the PSA levels are uh, between zero and four, what do you tell the patient? Or what will be your response? If the PSA ratio is big, uh, so if the PSA, you do the PSA, Total PSA and you find it is between zero and four nanograms per deciliters. What will you tell the patient? Or what would be your next move? Yeah, so this is probably something non cancerous, right? And maybe you would send them in for investigation for um, non cancerous, um, non cancerous um, etiologies. Now, you do this test and you find it's above 10. What will you do? Yeah, you proceed and do the biopsies, you treat it as um sort of malignant. Yeah, so you start dealing it dealing with it urgently. Now you've done a total PSA and define it is between four and ten. Uh sorry, four and ten exactly. So what do you do? Yeah, you do a free PSA. That you're able to calculate the PSA uh, ratio. Good. Now, what's the next question? Any questions on that? So, now, um, here we can see your pathology. Maybe you can describe the gross morphologic features of this. What if it is cancerous? As you just go like look at PSA. So what did you come up with? So when you do a PSA ratio and it's less than uh, 0 0.25, is it uh, at a high likelihood of malignancy or low likelihood? If it's less than 0 0.25. So less than two five, there's a high likelihood of malignancy. Uh -huh. And then you have a greater than 0 0.25, you have a lower likelihood of malignancy. Okay, that's great, guys. The diagnosis for maybe we can move up a little. The previous question. You are describing the gross morphology for this. So what do we see here? So 
is a slit like urethra. Yeah, so there's sort of an opening or a slit like cavity. Mm -hmm. What else? Maybe in the parenchyma of this tissue, I mean, this tissue, you can see something a bit abnormal color wise. Uh, so, someone says that the tumors are anchored at the periphery, but growing inwards. Okay, so I think what they're saying, they're growing from or to, from the posterior. And therefore, when they grow, they're sort of pushing the contents inwards. Someone says, well, circumscribed white areas. I agree. Now, are they big or small? I think they are small, they are so big. So again, this is a bit relative. Yeah. Someone said they are well circumscribed. Do they extend to the adjacent tissue? Okay, someone says yes, someone says no. So since they are well circumscribed, I don't think they are spinning or they are extending to that adjacent tissue, right? Yeah, so do you think this would be, what is the most likely pathology on display? Yeah, so there we have the prostate adenocarcinoma, which is an irregularly yellow shaped nodules. So also there are many multiple nodules. As you think about size, we can also think about number when describing some of these pathologies. Okay, move to the next one. Let's move to the next pathology. Any questions on that? So, so, um, what do we see in this image? Maybe we can describe the gross morphological feature. Is this organ smooth or does it have multiple wave like indentations which are rough? Right? So, what organ could this be? Stomach, yeah, because of the ruga. Now, what is the most likely diagnosis? So we have the Nature's disease, right? So this is where you have hypoplasia of the gastric mucosa leading to hypertrophic rugae. Remember, hyperplasia is increase in number of cells and hypertrophy is increase in size. So we have extremely large rugae due to the extremely increased number of um, cells in the gastric mucosa. That's what you call Menetia's disease. Now, what are some of the features that people with this disease will present with? What are some of the typical features? Early satiety, yes. So, um, just to turn on YouTube, you are full. Any other? Weight loss, exactly. Any other? Also, you have the anorexias, the vomiting, epigastric pain, and assume anemia. Anemia may be not because there is diatomesis, but it can also be edema. So, the formula for that you use. Wave V, wave that is weight loss, anorexia, vomiting, epigastric pain, and edema. I hope uh, that's okay. Any questions? Okay. 
This is a child who has a red strip across the face on one side. What's the most likely diagnosis? So I repeat for WV, we have weight loss, anorexia, vomiting, and gastric pain. Yeah, so the correct identification of the pathology is port wine syndrome. So name the disease above, sorry, name the disease the above condition is commonly associated with, that's true Weber's syndrome. We labor too much on that, maybe we can move to the next one. So that's under the diseases of the vascular diseases or blood vessel diseases. Now, um, here we have another pathology. What do we think this pathology would be? With multiple um, lesions, which are red. Yeah, so someone says papyrus. Yeah, and I agree. So this is Henoch scondine papyrus. It's a small vessel vasculitis. We have deposition of IgA in the skin because of membranes, kidney, and abdominal vessels. Now, that, um, identify its tetrad. So it's tetrad, it's uh, are probably the, the symptoms or probably how it presents or uh, probably what um, is seen when you have henloth, and hence, sorry, henloth, scondine, papyrus. We have things like a pyritic crush, abdominal pain, um, hematuria, remember this, kidney, um, being affected by deposition of IgA, you have arthritis, right? Mucosal of membranes, synovial membrane being affected by deposition of IgAs. Right? So tetrads include pituitary crash, membrane pain, materia, and arthritis. Move to the next one. Here we have a child with both kind of legs facing each other. Now, what do you think the pathology could be? Polio. Don't right? Yeah, that's right. Rickets. Exactly. So that's rickets. What is the pathophysiology of rickets? How do you come about and get tickets? Exactly. So you have a vitamin D deficiency. So usually, normally, when you have um, vitamin D um, and everything is working well, the vitamin D will promote absorption of calcium and phosphate um, from the intestines to the blood, right? And this will raise the levels of calcium and phosphate in the blood. Now, in rickets, when you lack vitamin D, there's less calcium and phosphate um, being driven into the blood, right? So in the blood, you have decreased levels of calcium, decreased levels of phosphate. Now, when you have decreased levels of calcium, the parathyroid will, the, sorry, the thyroid uh, will sense and um, the follicular cells will be prompted to release parathyroid hormone. When the parathyroid hormone is prompted to, to release um, calcium, you'll have to get this calcium from somewhere. And usually when parathyroid hormone is looking to enable or to mobilize calcium, it usually gets this calcium from the bones. So once it picks that calcium from the bones, the bones are left weak, brittle, and therefore sort of have this bent-like appearance. And that's how low or lower vitamin or vitamin D deficiency can lead to um, rickets. Is that okay? I hope it's better understood. Explanation is sort of there. So basically for the explanation, vitamin D aids in absorption of calcium phosphate. When you don't have vitamin D from the intestines, that is, when you have insufficient vitamin D, does that lead to? It leads to reduced 
absorption of calcium and phosphate from the intestines. We have reduced calcium in through absorption from the intestines, the levels of calcium in the blood will drop. When the levels of calcium in the blood drop, parathyroid hormone is released from the thyroid. Now, when this parathyroid hormone is released, it looks to mobilize calcium from the bones. This will leave the bones being more brittle because they are undergoing resorption. Okay. Move to the next pathology. Mm. So here we can see, maybe someone can try step the pathology. What do you think this pathology could be? Any choice? So there's this sort of bony protuberance on this image, and this is usually characteristic of osteochondroma. So osteochondroma is simply a bony. You see, to look for the bony projection. When you see a bony projection on imaging or on a picture, that's most likely osteochondroma. It's the most common type of benign bone tumor. It's a gross morphology. You say this that bony protuberance and cauliflower appearance. In when you look at it under microscopy, you see a capped layer of or a capped layer of cells, and they are capped with cartilage. The treatment is basically excision if they are too large um, or um, they are affecting you cosmetically, so you can just cut them off or excise them. Now we move to the next question. Here I'd like us to describe the gross morphology. What can we see in the picture given? Mm -hmm. What can we see in the pictures? Yes, so they have some yellow areas or yellow deposits. Um, most of us assume it's fat. Okay. I'm not sure, but yeah, fat. So we have this yellow like appearance. And also we have some whitish calcification. Appearance, yeah, like whitish appearance as well. Yeah, so basically we have this yellow and whitish calcifications. Also, maybe towards the edges you have some red. Maybe I could point out to some hemorrhage, right? Now, what is the most likely pathology on display? Osteosarcoma. Mm -hmm. Any other tries? Was it osteosarcoma? So this is what you call an chondrosarcoma. Sorry. So this is the chondro. Sarcoma. So it is evidence or characteristic is the white and yellow calcifications and the cartilaginous appearance. Now, any questions? Basically, that was the gross morphology. The other question is uh, where does it mainly arise in when you have sweet bones? Next question. We've already described a gross morphology. Let's move to the next pathology. I want us to go over this quickly so that um, we finish and do something else. Um, the next, the next pathology. Yeah, the next picture. I think the next picture is giving this better. 
Let's move to the next. Ah, okay. This guy the best is over here. Yes, the hemorrhagic areas evidenced by the reddish appearance. Mm -hmm. How about the black? Yeah, areas of necrosis. Yeah. On the other side, you can see the sort of a... Yeah, basically, that's the reddish and blackish areas. So what is the most likely diagnosis for this? Yeah, so this is what you call the osteoclastoma or giant cell tumor because of the bubble like appearance or the soap bubble like appearance. So when you see this, it looks like a soap bubble. And also, so the x ray um, or the image imaging study here, and it looks like it's a void. Yeah, it looks like um, there's nothing in it and it's like a balloonish appearance. So that is what you call soap bubble appearance. And uh, when you look at the gross morphology, you see areas of hemorrhaging and crossing together with the soap bubble appearance. That's a telltale sign of osteoclastoma or giant cell tumor. Okay, move to the next pathology. So of importance is um, you're able to sort of differentiate how the major features or the major pathologies sort of present. Because you can see, for example, the osteosarcoma and the chondrosarcoma, you can easily um, fail to distinguish between them. But the chondrosarcoma had a yellow white calcification. And now we are going to see the osteosarcoma. Maybe we can describe how it looks or some of the mesopathologic features. So this is, I've already even given it out, that is the osteosarcoma. So what are some of the features of the osteosarcoma? Gross morphologic features. Mm -hmm. Any tries? So basically, you have um, areas of necrosing and hemorrhaging. You have lifting of the periosteum. There you can see like this infiltration of these um, malignant cells in the periosteum. So it's kind of being lifted. We also have the gray-white appearance. Now, there are some radiological features you expect to see in osteosarcoma. What are these radiological features you expect to see in um, osteosarcoma? Exactly, we have the sunburst appearance and the codeman's triangle. Great. Those are doing extremely well. Now, we have two presenting clinical features of uh, osteosarcoma. How will a person with osteosarcoma present with a like? So we have uh, bone pain. Exactly, we have bone pain, we have swelling in that area, and we also have pathological fractures. Key symptoms that includes fever, night sweats, weight loss, so probably um fever. The night sweat, night sweats and weight loss, maybe someone can confirm for us. But there will be pathological fractures bone pain and swelling. Now let's describe the microscopic features of osteosarcoma. What do you expect to see under microscopy when you look at an osteosarcoma? Yeah. You expect to see hyperchromatic, exactly, polymorphic, Oh, sorry, pleomorphic nuclei, right? We have high mitosis, rapidly dividing cells, and also hyperchromatic nuclei. Yeah? 
Yeah, you can see some of these are very cut across the board. You, know, you can use them for most of these tumors, right? These are like characteristic of tumor cells. Hyperchromatic, pleomorphic nuclei, and high mitosis. So this is basically showing the various bone tumors and where they are, where they appear and how they look like. You can see there the osteosarcoma presenting with some lifting of the periosteum. Also, it's a large bulky tumor mass. Um, maybe you can get some time and look at that. The giant cell tumor. Um, you can see there the soap bubble sort of appearance. We move to the next pathology. Okay, so this is what I'll assume is a picture from an electron microscope. Huh. Now let's try and define um give a diagnosis for the microvascular feature that is being shown. What could be the diagnosis for this? This is glomerular thrombotic microangiopathy, characterized by the crescent formations. Right? So you can see this, this sort of a more reddish appearing C like appearance. So I suppose that is the C like or crescenteric shape of glomerular thrombotic microangiopathy. What immunological features do you? Hematological features, do you expect a person with glomerular thrombotic macroangiopathy to present with? What are some of the hematological features you expect them to present? Things like hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. Right? So those are the correct responses. But any others that you'll expect? Oh, so we move to the next malig um sorry the next pathology here we have a uh, malignancy maybe we can describe the gross morphological features A solitary nodule with tan yellow appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, tan yellow, I would call it um, probably grayish whitish. It's bulging. Exactly. What else can we see? Is it, um, so I think we mentioned large, right? No, so it's also large. Yes, someone mentions well circumscribed. I agree. Now, um, do we see areas of hemorrhaging or areas of necrosis? There is extensive invasion. Yes, exactly. So it is invading the adjacent tissues. I agree. It's a good response especially for the first one. The second one, it's well circumscribed, but the first one, probably a little, but there's sort of um, there's sort of conflict or opposing views when you say something is solid and something is invasive, you know, not solid, but well circumscribed, yeah? So maybe we can go with well circumscribed for this one. But for A, you might argue and probably get the first image. Now, what do you think could be the correct identification for this pathology? Yeah, so this is a Wilms tumor. What are some of 
what are the sorry identify the age at which they are most at risk so who are most at risk of getting the Williams tumor yeah so it's there children age two to five so those are the people who are high, at more at risk of getting Williams tumor now what are some of the clinical features of Williams tumor how will the patient present Hematuria, exactly, because of injury to the kidney, leading to bleeding. Hypertension, yes. Abdominal pain, exactly. There will be a palpable abdominal mass, yeah. Also, don't forget features of anemia, such as dizziness and headache and palpitations. Why do we have features of anemia? Um, someone says obstruction. Maybe that's not a cause of features of anemia. Maybe that's a clinical feature. Yeah, so there's impaired erythropoietin production. And erythropoietin is the one that um sort of makes the red blood cells. So when you have impaired erythropoietin, um, you have less oxygen carrying capacity. Therefore, you get anemia. Now, the gross morphological features we've described, so it's solitary, well circumscribed, rounded, soft in consistency, pale gray, cystic, necrotic, and hemorrhagic. Now, under histology, see undifferentiated blastema, stromal tissue, epithelial tissue, and you can see some evidence of hematuria. Now, the gene abnormality that causes the womb's tumor to occur is called the WT1 or WT2 gene mutations. So for those mutations, I think it's pertinent you get them and keep them and you know them. So womb's tumor 1 and womb's tumor 2 gene mutations. Okay, move to the next pathology. Uh, let's describe the gross morphologic features for this. Multiple cysts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cystic appearance, and they are multiple. Which organ is this most likely to be? The kidney. All right, so maybe let's name the pathology. So this is polycystic kidney disease. Which other organs can be affected by multiple cysts or multiple cystic um, appearance? We have the liver. Yes, we saw that last time. Any others? Ovary. Yeah. Also, which other? We saw the liver last time, the ovary. And also you can have it in the pancreas and in the brain. Yes, the brain, exactly. Now, which gene is affected so that you get this polycystic kidney disease? Like for example, you say WT1 is affected in gene mutation causes Williams tumor. How about polycystic kidney disease? Which gene? So we have A, AD1, and 2. Exactly. You guys are doing well. We've already described this morphology. We say that we have a parenchyma, which is largely, largely replaced with cysts. And also we have an enlarged kidney. So we forgot to mention enlarged kidneys. Now we move to the next pathology, membranoproliferative nephritis. Someone is asking, does one have multiple cysts in all these organs at the same time? So maybe not. 
I guess because we've seen like some of these diseases, you have to have some gene mutations. So maybe you can have a gene mutation for um the kidney, polycystic kidney disease, and not for any other organs. Maybe you can have cysts in the brain due to some pathological um currencies such as ischemia and not have it in certain parts of the the other parts of the body, such as the liver and the kidney. So I think they are largely um independent of each other. But you can find them also it and don't find it together. Okay. Now here we have some kind of um image, microscopic image. And um maybe as a clue you have a tram track appearance. Now which glomerulomembrano proliferative glomerular disease the kind of demonst is demonstrated here with the tram track appearance? Maybe we can give it a try. Yeah, so basically, um, I think this is just, um, maybe I can try explaining this. So basically, the diagnosis here, I'm sorry, um, it's supposed to be, this is membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, right? But usually, exactly, there are about um, three types. So the first type, so all three types cause proliferation of mesangial and endothelial cells in the glomerulus. Now, for the first type of memoroperiferative, memorilla nephritis, it is the one which is most common. And usually its cause is idiopathic, but it can also be secondarily caused by hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Also, you can get it um, from her heredity or gene defects in the antitrypsin um, protein. Its mechanism of action can happen in two ways. You can have it as a type 3 hypersensitivity, or you can have inappropriate activation of alternative pathway of complement. So when you have circulating immune complexes, reach a, or which are released by maybe hepatitis B or hepatitis C, they reach the glomerulus and activate the complement there. This will lead to complex deposition in the sub um, endothelial layer. So what they basically mean, for type 1 membranoproliferative um, glomerulonephritis, we've said it can be caused by hepatitis B and hepatitis C, right? So basically what you have, we have this um, pathogen that comes and it causes us an immune reaction. So this immune reaction will cause the formation of an immune complex, which will go then to the um, glomerulus and it will activate the complement. And this complement pathway will be the classical pathway. And now this complex will be, deposit, be deposited in the subendothelial layer. Now the second way is inappropriate, inappropriate activation of alternative pathway. Here we have, remember we have um, C3 convertase, which converts C3 to C3A and C3B. Now what usually happens, inappropriate activation can cause, um, can be caused by genetic mutations, for example, and this can lead to chronic overproduction um, of C3, right, leading to its depletion because um, C3A has not been inactivated. And therefore, these are the two ways where you can get a membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis type 1. Now for this, um, maybe anything else I've forgotten? When you look at this um, pathology under, under the mic light microscopy, you see it has um, this tram track like uh, appearance that is um, type one. And how do you come up with this tram track appearance? So basically we have um, what you call a collagen type four in the granular basement membrane. Um, sorry, how did you come up with this? I've forgotten the exact pathology of how you come up with this um, pathology. But usually when you see these things that look like train tracks going in a circular manner, that is mostly indicative of 
Embryo-proliferative nephritis. I think um, maybe the explanations, um, 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 I'll confuse a bit, but maybe I can give you um, the basic, basically how they look under light microscopy, immunofluorescence, and um, light microscopy. So when you just see the tram track appearance, you know that is a membrane proliferative membrane nephritis. Don't worry too much about type 1, type 2, type 3. Tram track appearance, sorry, glomerulonephritis. Now move to the next one. Now we have a Goodman um, pasture syndrome. Now this is an immunofluorescence image. And the way to identify Goodman pasture disease is we have this linear pattern, which is caused by IgG binding to collagen. So when you see this smooth diffuse linear pattern um, deposited on the smooth um, the glomerular basement membrane, that is Goodman or Good pastures disease. So you see these um, sort of arms or branches are running linear to each other. So that's indicative of Goodman pasture disease. So this is a type of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis caused by cellular injury to the underlying glomerular basement membrane, um, which leads to it becoming permeable to red blood cells and inflammatory mediators. And this will lead to um, the position of these complexes. And when you see when when you expand a normally thin um, membrane and allow it to allow many more substances to enter in, um, it will form um, the, uh, so you'll have inflammation, and this inflammation will lead to the breakage of the membrane, and therefore you'll have this appearance or this pathology under uh, immunofluorescence, Goodman Pasteur's disease. So maybe. Um, any clarification you want on Goodman pastures? Maybe I can try to explain it better. So yeah, some, someone says they want clarification. So for the Goodman pastures disease, the common underlying feature is a rapidly progressive nephritis, right? So, so that's basically Goodman's pasture syndrome is an example of a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. So basically what you have is cellular injury that causes the underlying glomerular basement membrane to break, allowing materials to um, in circulation, for example, red blood cells, inflammatory mediators and plasma cells, and macrophages even to pass through the Bowman's capsule. So in the presence of all these cells, you lead to expansion of the normally thin layer of cells into the thick characteristic crescent moon shape. So basically, um, you have damage to this membrane. It becomes more permeable. When it becomes more permeable, all these substances enter. And then its characteristic shape will change from thin to thick. And then under immunofluorescence, you'll have this um, sort of linear pattern. It's a better explanation. Next image. Any questions? Okay. So maybe we can describe a histology. Here we have thick. Uh, the capillary loops are thickened, but uh, there is no increase in cellularity. I think um, this is what you call membranous neuropathy. So basically for this, um, I think for this, we just um, had to sort of, we didn't have time to fully prepare for this. I didn't have time to fully prepare for this, but um, I had like um, crumbed the image. So basically if you're in a time fix and there's no time, maybe you can sort of photograph this image and know how to explain this pathology. So you have capillary loops that are thickened and there is no increase in cellularity. Anybody who knows how to explain that pathology maybe can help us out.
Así es, me envías nuestra página. Let's move to the next one. We have post infectious um, immunophritis. So last time we talked about this as well. We said it is uh, someone tells us for the membranous nephropathy, we have a spike and dome appearance due to subendothelial deposits. Great, I think that's awesome. So, when you talk to describe um, the ink histopathy for membranous neuropathy, nephropathy, you say the spike dome appearance, sub epithelial deposits. Yes. Move to the next one. Name or state the histological features. So, what are some of the histological features of post infectious glomerulonephritis? So, last time we were talking about uh, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, we said it's an nephritic syndrome and it's also had type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, which commonly occurs in children and occurs two to four weeks after group A strep infection. Right? We said um, group A strep. As usually has the M protein, and therefore we'll have hypersensitivity reaction type 3, where you have antibodies, mainly IgG and IgM, forming in immune complex with this antigen, which is now the group A strep. Antibodies are, or this antibody antigen complex will be deposited subendothelially between the podocytes and the molecular basement membrane. These immune complexes will initiate inflammation. And um, the reaction in the glomerulus will involve activation of deposition of complement and will have deposition of C3 complement. And this, under light microscopy, you see as large hypercellular glomerulus. Under immunofluorescence, you will see C3 deposits, IgM deposits in the glomerular basement membrane and mesangium. And on electron microscopy, you will see subendothelial deposits known as HAMPs. So for immunofluorescence, when you see the IgM, IgGs, and C3 deposits in the glomerular basement membrane or in the mesangium, you will have this sort of starry sky appearance. You look at the same piece of specimen under electron microscopy, you see hump-like appearance. So like heel-like appearance, and that is what we call humps. So that is how you describe the um, features of postetrococcal nephritis. So the image here below is, I believe, immunofluorescence. And for immunofluorescence, we can see this starry sky appearance, which is basically IgM, IgG, and C3 deposits from the complement. And uh, above that, the image that we are shown first probably is what we call now um, the bumpy or humpy or hump um, appearance. Is that better understood now? So here we have a um, medullary sponge kidney. Um, I think um, that's just naming the pathology. And maybe we can describe some of the pathological features we see quickly as we move on. What are some of the pathological features we can see? I can see some cavities, you know, there's some purulent like materials on top of it. There are multiple nodules around or inside the organ as well. Maybe those are some of them that you can use to explain it. Now, next we have what we call xanthogranulomatous nephritis. What are some of the clinical features of a person presenting with um, this type of pyelonephritis? Mm 
how would you expect a patient with um this kind of xanthogranulomatous panulomatitis to present us some of the features? Yes, that we hematuria, dysuria, flank pain. Mm -hmm. Exactly, those are doing well. Anorexia, chills, fever. Mm -hmm. Now, Let's describe the gross morphology and the microscopic findings of this pathology. Grossly, how, how does it look grossly? What can you see? So there's an irregular mass exactly. So mass like lesion. Probably well circumscribed, whitish in appearance, all that. Now, under microscopy, you will see forming macrophages intermingled with plasma cells and lymphocytes. Like renal cells, as you know. Yeah, I agree. In agreement with that. Okay, move to the next. Rapidly progressive or progressive glomerulonephritis. Here we have chrysenteric glomerulonephritis. Remember, we mentioned one before that is the good man. Oh, sorry, good pastures um, syndrome. Now we have another one here. So, um, first image I think is electron microscopy, and the second image is immunofluorescence. So that is um, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, chrysenteric glomerulonephritis. Has this crescent-like appearance in the immunofluorescence image? And also to some extent in the electron microscopy. So maybe you can begin to pick that up, especially the immunofluorescence image. As this C shape appearance, that will be chrysenteric glomerulonephritis. Move to the next one. We have focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. So this is more common in adults. And it's primarily idiopathic, but you can also get it familiarly through mutations in the Apple one gene. Risk factors include um, people who abuse heroin, HIV uh, positive, and um, where you have uh, interferon use, which is immunosuppressant. Immuno, which is an immunosuppressant. Now, here we, what you'll see is effacement of food processes under light microscopy. You also have hyalinosis, which is deposition of proteins and lipids in the glomerulus. You also have tubular atrophy, sclerosis, and scar tissue formation. Under immunofluorescence, it is often either negative for deposits of C3, C1, and IgM. Under electron microscopy, you also see effacement of food processes. So basically, um, that is how focal segmental. Okay. So for this, maybe um, state the diagnostic features. We have atrophy of tubules and interstitial fibrosis. Remember, we've said that uh, under light microscopy, you see hyalinosis, the position of proteins in tubular atrophy or sclerosis. So that is a telltale feature of nephritis. 
any consequence. So maybe that part that has been underlined or circled with yellow, that is probably the hyalinosis, the position of proteins and lipids. So when you see that, highly suggestive of focal segment of glomerular sclerosis. Okay, we move to the next one. Uh, let's describe this pathology. Yeah, we have yellow areas. Well circumscribed. Mm -hmm. yeah, so basically, also some areas of hemorrhage and all that. Now, what could be the most likely diagnosis? Yeah, so this is renal cell carcinoma. Which part of the kidney does the renal cell carcinoma usually originate from, mostly? Mm -hmm. Which part of the nephron does it usually arise from this renal cell carcinoma? The tubules. So which part of uh, which part? The proximal? Tibular epithelio, that's correct. Maybe what is the classical triad or how will patients classically present when they have a renal cell carcinoma? We have flank pain, exactly, hematuria, anemic features, I agree. And also palpable mass. Guys are doing extremely well. If you're done with that, you can move to the next one. So here we see this is um vulva carcinoma. One says hypertension, then also carcinoma. Yes, but maybe they can put down um the pathophysiology of hypertension in renal cell carcinoma, how how it comes about. Now here we have vulva carcinoma. There's no much explanation. Maybe just um look at the picture, and I have it in mind. The next is a Bushkilowinstein's tumor. So well, maybe we can just have a picture of that and have it in mind. The next one I think is the more important one. We have um invasive cancer of the uterine cervix. So um, for the gross morphology, you can see the picture on the right. Sorry, not on the right, on the left. Yeah, you can see there's this large irregular masses, some sort of whitish appearance, some hemorrhaging, some crosses. So that will guide you towards invasive cancer of the uterine cervix. On the right side, you can see these pleomorphic cells. Yeah, hyperchromatic and all that highly indicative of malignancy. Okay, we'll move to the next one. Now, this has been, this is human papilloma virus. What are the risk, what are the high risk types or subtypes of human papilloma virus? Of 16 and 18. Right. Now, give two preventative measures or modalities for human papilloma virus. Vaccination. Mm -hmm.
abstinence. Abstinence, I'll be able to put a question on here and also self safe, safe practices, screening. Yeah, having single partner, a single partner. So avoiding multiple sexual partners. Yeah, and all that. So for abstinence, abstinence um, maybe, maybe not pregnant. Sometimes these people um, are in the reproductive um, age period where they need um, how do they feed and um, the question of abstinence um, is a question of, you know. So I think um, it's more pertinent to include things like immunization, self, self safe sex practices, and uh, all that. And also keeping to one single partner. Okay, next is um, the tetralogy of fallow. And here basically you have um, the tetralogy, we have pulmonary stenosis, right, which leads to right ventricular hypertrophy, which leads to an overheading, um, sort, of, sort of a VSD, central ventral, ventricular septal defect, which leads to um, avoiding outer. Now, the next down there, we have an image. Maybe you would like us to describe this image. Mm -hmm. So what do we see in this image? Someone says, Marcus the verticular. Mm -hmm. So for Marcus the verticular, we say there will be an outpouching. Um, I don't think the outpouchings are really clear here. So maybe another pathology. So which organ is this? Yes, this is the colon, right? In this colon, is this the normal size of the colon? It's sort of enlarged, exactly, ballooned or, swell, or swollen. So this is what you call um, congenital aganglionic megacolon, Hirschsprung's disease. How do we get Hirschsprung's disease? Like the colon. How does it come about? What is the pathology? What is the pathology? Yes, failure of the neurocrest cells to descend to the GI. That's great. Okay, we move to the next image. So basically here we're trying to show um, breast pathologies at one go. You can have a look at that, have Pygates disease. Um, there's um, fibrocystic diseases and all that. Maybe you can move to the next. Ah, okay. So here yeah, I think we also have a pathology. Maybe we can describe the gross morphology of this. As we're about to finish. Yeah, multiple cystic-like um, lesions, areas of necrosis, yellow-like appearance. Yeah, so what is the most likely diagnosis? Ductal. Okay, so someone says ductal dilation. So yeah, most likely diagnosis. Ductal ectasia. So the gross morphology, we have those dilated ducts, someone mentioned, thick secretions and cheesy-like secretions, the ones that we call yellow. So those are cheesy and thick-like secretions. For microscopic features, you'll have ducts filled with granular, granular debris, um, leucocyte, leucocytes present, destroyed epithelial lining, um, and also um, you have a uh, Plasma cell infiltration, granulomas, 
with linaperidactyl stroma. So this is the most distinctive feature. The lymphocyte infiltration, plasma cell infiltration, and granulomas with that peridactyl stroma. So the most distinctive features of this ductal ectasia. Now here we have um, any questions on that? Next we have a picture of a nipple and a histology picture. Now, what's the most likely diagnosis? Maybe we we'll jump the gun. Um, what are some of the gross pathological features? Yeah, so we have Pygates disease of the nipple. So what are some of the gross morphological features that led us to this diagnosis? Yeah, erythema, red in color, good. There's a vesicular rash, a pruritic rash, a pruritic eruption. Mm -hmm. There's also eczematous, exactly, crust like or scaling appearance right now for the microscopic features what do you expect to see so you expect to see target cells infiltrate the entire thickness of the epidermis singly or in nests they have voluminous clear or pale eosinophilic cytoplasm vesicular nuclei prominent nucleoli and increased mitotic activity. We also have glandular and acina structures and signet ring cells with intracytoplasmic mucin, which may be present. Now, classify the above pathology. It is a non invasive carcinoma. Differentiated between, um, sorry. So basically, the next question is just um, how to differentiate between the stages of tumors and also. Um, be careful to know what's the difference between grade of a tumor and stage of a tumor. So the grade is the level of differentiation of the cells under the microscope, and the stage is to the extent to which the tumor has spread. And below there is an image of stages. Now, stage three tumors with an egg fried egg appearance. Here it is. We have this germinoma. Seminoma and oligodendroma. Now, um, move to the next question. Here we have a pathology. What could it be? Exactly, that's retinoblastoma. In which age group does it commonly occur? Yes, in children less than five years old. What are some of the likely complications that may arise if the eye is left untreated? Mm -hmm. We can attempt. Raised intracranial pressure. Mm -hmm. Intracranial extension, blindness, of course. Mm -hmm. You can also have things like retinal detachment, exactly, retinal necrosis, orbital invasion, optic nerve invasion, secondary neoplasias or neoplasms, 
metastasis, tumor recurrence, temporal bone hypoplasia, cataracts, radiation neuropathy, radiation retinopathy. So those are kind of the complications that may arise if you don't treat retinoblastoma. What are some of the what are the what are other differential diagnoses of this pathology? Maybe instead of retinoblastoma, what else could it be? What else does it look like? Maybe we can attempt. Strabismus. Hmm. Maybe what? So I think strabismus is when you have misalignment. One of gaze. On genital cataracts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some of them include persistent anterior fetal vasculature, persistent posterior fetal vasculature, Coats disease, retinopathy of prematurity, toxocariasis, uveitis, um, vitro, vitro retinal dysplasia, coloboma um, of the choroid and optic disc and posterior cataracts. So those are some of the differential diagnoses. Maybe you can take two or three um, and um, be confident with those. Pick the easiest ones. So identify the most common presenting features of this. So someone has already mentioned one, Leuco, Coria. This is a whitish pupillary reflex and is the most common presenting feature and accounts for 60% of the cases. Someone already mentioned um, this strabismus, the second most presenting feature and is therefore important. So basically the presenting features will include hypochoria, Trabismus, painful red eye, inflammation, um, decreased vision, restriction of extraocular movement and metastatic disease. So it can spread to the lymph nodes, the liver, the lung, the bone, and all that. Any questions on that? So which gene is affected by retinoblastoma? Or which gene leads to formation of which gene mutation leads to formation of retinoblastoma? Yeah, the yeah, retinoblastoma gene. And usually you need to have, I think, two hits. Okay. Now we'll skip the part of it. Now, um, yeah, we can see a pathology shown. What could this pathology be? So this is actinic keratosis. Now this is UV induced premalignant skin lesion. Now under histopathology, what do you expect to see? Maybe we can describe the histopathology of this. So we have the hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis, and multiple enlarged nuclei under histopathology. I think we are done with um, spots. So, and uh, we discussed so much, and uh, I think from there, um, you can be able to sort of handle more spots, maybe look at the pots and uh, look at more pictures, go to the web path, try to describe those pathologies with sort of the gross morphology, and try to just look at the pictures and gain more confidence.